Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about some of the core ideas in computer architecture. So these ideas largely come from uh, the Patterson and Hennessy, so David Patterson and John Hennessy, uh, their book, Computer Organization and Design, which I'd encourage you to take a look at if you're interested in architecture. Now, these ideas aren't things like caches and store buffers and reorder buffers. We're more so talking about the high level guiding principles behind computer architecture. So let's go ahead and get started. And our first uh, idea is abstraction. And this is something we've talked about uh, for a decent bit in the last video. So primarily we use abstraction to improve productivity. So it's really nice that our software developers can uh, write their code in Python or C++ instead of in low level assembly. So they can be uh, you know, fairly far away from the actual hardware in terms of how they're thinking about their applications. Now inside of computer architecture, we use abstractions quite a bit. So for example, we create abstract models of our hardware that we provide to system software, right? In the forms of instruction set architectures or ISAs. Now we also use these abstractions within uh, computer architecture in terms of how we think about our hardware structures. So, you know, when we're thinking about our caches or reorder buffers, we're not thinking about them in terms of say the gates and transistors that they'll eventually be made out of, we're thinking about them in terms of their uh, behaviors and their functionalities. So we can kind of black box away some of those implementation details and abstract them away. Now, another idea that we have in computer architecture is this one of making the common case fast. So this really boils down to how do we prioritize our optimizations and where do we spend our time and our silicon, both of which are finite resources. So it's often the case that a moderate improvement on the common case can be more impactful than a large improvement uh, to an infrequent case. So if we can, if we consider each of these bars to be, you know, the total execution time of a program with the top one being our baseline, we can see that we get more of an overall speed up from a two X improvement to the execution time of the orange section than an infinite speed up of the teal section. So even though we're only getting 2x on the orange section compared to infinite speed up of the teal section, our overall execution time is a lot better, right, in this bottom case here, right? Because we're focusing on whatever the common case is, right? The part of our program or the operations that are taking the longest. Now, there's always caveats that are going to be here in terms of making the common case fast. So for example, this is also heavily dependent on how easy it is to get this 2x speed up, right? Versus this infinite speed up. If getting this 2x speed up is incredibly difficult, but getting this infinite speed up is very easy, then it's probably gonna be worth it to get this, you know, teal speed up. Okay, so another idea that we have, right? On the same train of thought on performance is performance via parallelism. So there are limits to how far we can optimize serial execution. And this is something that uh, you know, CPU companies had to deal with in the early to mid 2000s, right? So it became very difficult to get performance by purely optimizing single threaded execution. So performance via parallelism, so multiple threads and multiple cores really started to become the primary way that we got performance starting in you know, 2005, 2006. Now we often have multiple tasks and we worked on a parallel and so we can improve performance by working on multiple things at once. Another idea, right, sticking on this topic of performance and also parallelism we have is this idea of performance via pipelining. So some operations can't be overlapped completely, right? And, but we may be able to partially overlap them, right? And this is just another uh, form of parallelism. So we can improve performance by overlapping pipeline stages. And the common example of this is with the instructions that we end up executing. So our CPUs, they have pipelines and we use these kinds of diagrams to show, you know, what the pipeline kind of looks like um, as we're in executing instructions over time. So each of these rows say represents, you know, a different phase of an instruction being executed. And you can see that we can overlap them, right? So we can overlap each of these instructions so that we're making use of our entire five stage pipeline at once. So while one instruction is in the write back stage, another instruction can be in the memory stage, another instruction can be in the execute stage, 
another in the decode stage and another in the fetch stage, right? So this is a lot better than say having one instruction, right? Execute from end to end, do all of these stages before the next one can start, right? So we can pipeline them instead and, ha and overlap these subparts of the instructions. Okay, so another way we can get performance um, is through prediction. Now, very obviously, waiting on results uh, wastes time and it wastes our resources. And our programs happen to be very dynamic, right? So we're often accessing different parts of memory. We're not just, say, going down a line and reading our entire, you know, uh, system of memory. Um, and we also end up jumping around a lot inside of our program. So we don't, you know, execute our programs like we would read a book. We don't go from top to bottom. We're often jumping around as we call functions and as we have, say, different branches and execute conditional statements. Now, because of this, we can often get a lot of performance by trying to predict what a program is going to do. So predict what kind of memory or what piece of memory we're going to access and predict uh, which uh, code we're going to execute next. So this can work very well in terms of improving performance, provided that our recovery mechanism, so in case we mispredict, provided whatever recovery mechanism we have for that isn't prohibitively expensive. So we need to make sure that on average, we're still improving performance and we're not wasting all of our time cleaning up after our own mistakes. So moving on to another category of ideas. So we have this one of hierarchy, uh, uh, hierarchies of memory. Now, ideally we would want an infinite amount of fast memory. And this is a very old idea dating all the way back to you know, John von Neumann's report uh, on the first stored program computer, where he, you know, he said that programmers would eventually want, you know, an infinite amount of memory uh, for their applications. Uh, but unfortunately, this really isn't practical, right? We, we can't have an infinitely sized cache. Um, now, luckily for us, though, programs often go through phases. So we're not, we're not typically accessing all of the data that our program will eventually access all at once. So we can use hierarchies of memory, right? Uh, memories of different performance and different cost to get the illusion of infinite fast memory. So on the right-hand side here, we typically have, say, at the very top of this hierarchy, we have our fast expensive memory, like caches, and we'll have a small amount of it. And then as we go down the hierarchy, we get a memory that's cheaper, but you know slower, so like DRAM, and then getting all the way down to our slow cheap memory like disks. So, you know, as long as our program is accessing, you know, a small working set or relatively small working set at any given moment, we can fit most of that data inside of our cache or maybe inside of our cache and a little bit inside of our main memory. And then when we move into a different phase of our program, we can hopefully fit that working set of our data inside of our cache inside of our main memory. So we don't need to have this infinitely sized cache. We can get away with this uh, hierarchy of different kinds of memory. Now, another idea in computer architecture is this one of dependability via redundancy. So computers need to be dependable, right? We don't want our computers crashing all the time. And this is especially important when we start talking about embedded computers. So a computer that's controlling things in your car or a computer that's controlling things um, in a satellite, right? Where we can't replace something like that very easily. We need to make sure that it works uh, in the face of errors and it can recover from them. Now, we use redundancy, uh, or redundancy exists for many reasons. So part of redundancy is to handle manufacturing defects. So when we're actually making our chips, we don't want you know, defects during the manufacturing process to make all of our chips completely unusable. It's really nice if we have a way to say, turn off certain parts of our chips and allow them to be sold, say, with a different number of cores, or maybe at a lower frequency, or maybe, right, we have duplicate components on side of our processors so that we can just turn off those and use the redundant ones. Then, you know, we also use redundancy to handle errors at runtime, right? So, you know, if something happens at runtime, maybe a bit flips, you know, maybe we're able to recover from this. And, you know, if not recover, we're at least able to, you know, warn about that, you know, some error has happened, so we can at least detect these errors. So a very interesting form of these kinds of errors is something called an alpha strike, where an alpha particle can hit a transistor and cause a bit flip. And this is something that's, you know, 
not as much of a concern, say, on the surface level of the Earth, but is much more of a concern when you start talking about satellites that are exposed to much higher levels of radiation. Right? So suddenly, you know, redundancy is a very large issue, especially on satellites. Now, one final idea we have, which is somewhat deprecated and I believe is only briefly mentioned in the latest version of this uh, computer organization design book, is this idea of designing for Moore's Law. But I think it's useful to talk about it a bit uh, just for context and to kind of tell you where we are in computer architecture today. So for decades, you know, with computer architecture, we got basically double the amount of resources and performance every one and a half to two years. And this is from process technology improvements. So our transistors got smaller and smaller and smaller, and we were able to, you know, basically double the uh, clock rate. Uh, so go, going from say like one gigahertz to two gigahertz, right? We were, we were able to double that for, for many decades. But now, not so much, right? So it's very difficult for these process technology shrinks and it's very difficult to cool these chips and we certainly can't just be doubling um, the frequency of these chips, right? Due to power and heat constraints. But how exactly are we handling the situation, right? Is computer architecture done, right? Is there nothing else to do? Have we reached the end? Well, not so much. There's, there's plenty of very new and exciting ideas coming out. And this is actually a very exciting time in computer architecture. So we have brand new custom architectures coming out for you know, many different applications. So things like machine learning accelerators. Um, you even have you know, ideas for uh, accelerators specifically for serializing uh, protocol buffers, right? Very interesting stuff. We also are seeing very heterogeneous chips come out. So instead of having say uniform processor cores, we're having chips that have, you know, lots of memory integrated onto the chip in heterogeneous cores. So you'll have big cores and also small cores for different tasks and for power reasons. We also are seeing larger and larger chips. So it's no longer just, you know, having double the resources in the same area. Now we're just increasing the area of a lot of our chips. And where that's not possible, you know, we're also using things like chiplets now. So instead of just having, you know, individual chips that are connected via, you know, traditional means, we're now taking chips that may even be made on different process technologies and very tightly integrating them together on say pieces of silicon. That way, even if we can't build a very you know, large chip or it's very difficult to build a very large chip, we can tightly integrate these smaller chips so that they appear to be say a single chip. So there are many amazing ideas and it's a very exciting, exciting time in computer architecture right now. But that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. As always, I'm Nick and I hope you have a nice day.